Well, welcome to another podcast from School of Surgery. Um, today I'm with uh, Dr. Brett Dolman, um, and we're going to talk about something important. So, if you've got some data or you're looking at a paper that uh, has used a particular statistical test, it's important that the correct statistical test has been selected either by you when you're analysing your own data or by the authors whose paper you're reading. And if this test, correct test hasn't been selected, then the results and their conclusions are probably pretty much in doubt. And so, but it is difficult, I think, to, to know which test you need to select. And it's all quite complex. And so Brett's here to give us an easy guide to navigating those complexities so that when you read a paper or when you're analysing your own data, you know exactly what to do. So thanks very much, Brett. Thank you. So what I'm going to discuss today is selecting the correct statistical test. Now, people seem to get a bit scared by this process and seem to think it's some mysterious magical process where people can pluck out statistical tests from thin air based on their data. And what I really want to do is I want to help you understand that the process of select selecting your correct statistical test is a very nice logical process. So again, the learning objectives mainly is so you appreciate that selecting the correct statistical test is a very structured and logical process. And if you think about something you might be more familiar with, which is clinical guidelines, they are done in a very structured way where there's a box that leads you to another box based on particular circumstances and they're very easy to follow and I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm also going to discuss the various test assumptions I'm only going to touch on briefly but it's particular rules of statistical tests that need to be satisfied in order that you can use them and I'm also going to cover some basic research terms that will help you use the statistical flowchart so I'm going to start at quite a, a basic level but it should hopefully help everybody from different experiences with research understand the flowchart. So the first thing we're going to start off with is you have to ask yourself what, what type of dependent variable do you have? And just to cover the basics, so a type of variable. So the first type of vari variable would be our independent variable. And this is the variable that we either manipulate or, as a researcher or is a difference between particular groups within our study. So I'm going to touch a few times on an example. So let's consider an example of a study, a very simple study, where you want to see whether the scores on the MRCS exam differ by gender. So your independent variable in that case would be gender. Your dependent variable, or sometimes called outcome variable, is the thing that you are measuring, so it's your outcome. And in the example I've just given, that would be the MRCS exam result. So the previous slide was asking us about our dependent variable. So we want to look at the flowchart and decide what our dependent variable is, and we'll look at why that's important. Before we do that, I just want to touch on the different sorts of data you might have for your particular project. Now there's lots of ways of categorising this and there's lots of different terms but I think the most useful one is to remember the mnemonic NOIR and just think that from N to R it goes the data goes up in increasing complexity. So we'll start with probably the most basic form of data which is nominal data, sometimes called categorical data. And this is data that fits into categories but the categories don't have any order. And again, look at the example from the previous slide, so sex, men or women, that would be a nominal variable because we certainly wouldn't want to give any order to, to gender. Ladies first. Exactly. <laughs> Ordinal data is where you have categories but they have an order. And a classic example, which I'm sure most people have come into contact with, is something called a Likert scale where you would range from strongly disagree to strongly agree and that you would treat as ordinal data. Now, the next form of data is actually quite rare within research, and it's called interval data. And interval data is a form of continuous data where the difference between each point is equal, but there isn't any mathematical relationship between values. For example, and the classic example of this form of data is temperature measured on a Celsius scale. So 40 degrees Celsius is not twice as hot as 20 degrees Celsius. And that's because you put an arbitrary zero mm. line. 
Now, a good way of thinking about the difference between interval and ratio data is, in fact, if you take the Celsius scale, put it on a Kelvin scale, it then becomes ratio data. So ratio data is different to interval data in the sense of zero it means absence of that particular value. Mm. So thinking about height and weight are good examples. So if something's zero centimetres, that's absence of that particular mm. measurement. And it also means that values have a mathematical relationship between each other. And in actual fact, this is holds true for most continuous outcomes. So again, height would be an example where 100 centimetres is twice as much as 50 centimetres. And again, like I've said, that's most continuous data. So if we go back to the start of the flowchart on the left-hand side, we've asked ourselves what our dependent variable is. Now let's imagine that our dependent variable is either nominal or ordinal data. And this would take us to the next box here. And this is where we're asked what is our independent variable. So again, the example we gave previously was sex. Now, this would take you into two different directions. If you've got a nominal or ordinal independent variable, you would then use chi-squared test or Fisher's exact test, and we'll discuss that on the next slide. So chi-squared test is typically used to measure differences between categorical variables. Now, there's a particular assumption with the chi-squared test that I'm actually not going to cover because the same assumption is not needed for the Fisher's exact test. So I would say to always use the Fisher's exact test. Mm. Some would argue that computationally it takes longer, but modern statistical packages can do it mm. quite easily. So I would just not use the chi-squared test and always use Fisher's exact because it just makes things a lot easier. Right. And then you don't need to worry about the assumptions of the chi-squared test. Okay, so you can have you can have very, very few data points and still use Fisher's exact test. That's the, that's what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other term, the other one we looked at on the previous flowchart is logistic regression, and that's what you would use if you had a um, binary or ordinal um, outcome measurement as your dependent variable, but you had a interval or ratio independent variable, you would use logistic regression. However, that's quite an advanced um, analysis and beyond the scope of this podcast. So if you find yourself in that position, I would seek further advice from either supervisors or statisticians or somebody with experience of using <laughs> logistic regression. Okay, so we've dealt with all of the nominal and ordinal dependent variable tests that we actually need. We're going to move down now and you can see that now we're considering what is our type of dependent variable. So this is interval or ratio data. So this is where we've got a continuous outcome measurement. The next thing we need to consider is what, what is our research question? And the two main differences between the type of research question that we're going to consider is association or differences. And this is really related to our study hypothesis. So it's what do we actually want to find out with our study? Now, the example we gave previously, if we're looking at the differences between men and women on their results on the MRCS, exam, then this would be a differences because we want to know whether those two groups are different from each other. However, we may be interested in knowing if one variable, our dependent variable, is, is associated with the other. Mm. So, for example, a typical hypothesis might be we want to see whether duration of sleep the night before the MRCS exam is associated with scores on the MRCS exam. Mm. So we're wanting to know whether those two variables are associated with each other. And if we're worried about association, and that's what our study hypothesis is, we've then got a choice of two different tests. And you'll see a common theme coming throughout the rest of these statistical tests in that we need to decide whether to use a parametric or a non-parametric test. And we'll discuss how to do that. So we're at the point now where we want to find out whether two variables are associated with each other. And now we need to decide whether to use the parametric test, which is Pearson's, or the non-parametric test, which is Spearman's. And parametric just relates to a normal distribution. And this is a common theme with parametric tests. So <clears throat> just, just to be clear, if, if, if data is parametric and you're going to use a parametric test, it means it's distributed normally. That bell curve 
that uh, they see with a, a symmetrical about a, a midpoint. That's it. Yeah, they've yeah. they've all got that in common, um, and it's it's approximately normal. It gets a bit more complex, but essentially that's that's it. And you can do other tests on your data to which will tell you whether it's parametric or not. Exactly. Well, yeah. So the assumptions of the parametric Pearson's test is that both variables are normally distributed. And the way that you can investigate this quite simply is to do a histogram. Mm. Look at the shape of the histogram. If it looks normally distributed, then you satisfy that assumption of the parametric test. You also need to see whether there's a linear relationship between the variables. So you can use a scatter plot and that will you can see whether the relationship's linear. Some are a bit more complex. They might be quadratic and be in mm. weird shapes, but a lot of variables are generally line linearly associated. So you can test that quite simply with a scatter plot. And the third assumption is the one that we've already tested by getting to this point on the flowchart, which is do we have interval or ratio data? Mm. And then simply, if you violate assumptions one or three, you can then use Spearman's. Okay, so if it's not normally distributed and it's data other than interval or ratio? Yeah, so Spear means you can use ordinal data mm. as well. Right. Um, they would be the assumptions that you'd need to meet to use that. Okay, so the thing we've not considered when we were looking at the association side of the, the question is whether this is association or causation. So we'll discuss a bit about that now. So if we're looking at causation, then we'd want to use either linear or multiple regression. So you would use regression when a relationship is causal. And what we mean by causal is it needs to be clear that your independent variable causes the changes in the outcome variable. Mm. So we'll consider a clinical example now. If you think about height, so height is often used to predict your peak exposure flow rate. And there's quite nice equations you can do to determine mm -hmm. what a given peak exploitative flow rate is for a particular height, which you can derive from regression analysis. But think about the converse situation. It would be ludicrous to suggest that your peak exploitative flow rate predicts your height because mm. it's not causal. So it needs to be something that causes the other thing. Mm. So another example of a, a association rather than causation would be if you were to set up a study in a hospital and you were to look at the association between number of wrinkles and mortality, you would find a correlation between those two variables. Mm. However, it would be ludicrous to suggest that by treating wrinkles, you could reduce mortality with wrinkle cream. <laughs> so <Damn>. that's, <laughs> that's just a way of thinking about two variables that are associated with each other, but they're not causally, you know, yeah. wrinkles don't cause mortality. They're just a marker of so a third variable. Association is not causation. Exactly. And that's really what you want to kind of piece out when you're deciding whether to use correlation or mm. regression. Um, in terms of linear regression, it, it does have quite a lot of assumptions that, again, are beyond the scope of this podcast. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to take a different direction down the flowchart now. And we're going to look at, again, our type of research question. And again, this is with interval or ratio dependent variables. We're going to decide... We've already decided that we're going to look at the differences between groups. We then need to consider how many groups we have. So we just continued on to a different slide and we're back at the bit where we're deciding the number of groups we've got. So if we have two groups, we would go down one side of the flowchart. And if we had more than two groups, then we would go down the other. So, for example, men versus women would be two groups. If mm -hmm. we were looking at particular sets in school, let's say, you might have a set one, two, and three, and that would yep. be more than two groups. So we want to consider what the, what the relationship is between those two groups. So, for example, we could have two independent groups. Now, the two independent groups would be, again, the example we looked at previously, male and female, mm -hmm. where you can only belong to one of those groups and we're comparing both of them together. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, obviously, to belong to both, but that that's an example of independent groups. Yep. Repeated groups where we take the same group of people, so we might take all men, and we measure things on them at two different time points. So, for example, if we were looking at a study of an exercise intervention and we took their VO2 max before the exercise intervention and then afterwards, mm 
then that would be a repeated measures design. And that's, again, important to which statistical tests we select. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at independent groups, that is, for example, men versus women, we would use either the independent t-test or the man whitney u test, which is the non-parametric equivalent. OK, so the assumptions of the parametric independent samples t-test is again, we've already decided this based on the flowchart, but you would have either interval or ratio data. You need both groups to be normally distributed, which means you just do two histograms for each group, mm -hmm. and that would tell you whether that's normally distributed. There's other more advanced tests, but a histogram works in most circumstances, to be honest. And then there's a third term called homogeneity of variance. Now, if we just break this down simply, we could look at homogeneity just means the same. Mm -hmm. And variance is just your standard deviation squared. So essentially, homogeneity of variance means have we got roughly equal standard deviations in both groups? Mm. That is, is there the same amount of variability within yeah. both groups? So you look at you look at standard variation in group one, square it, you get a figure. Yeah. And a standard deviation squared in group two, and it should be the same if it's if you're going to use a parametric test. Yes. It's very similar. So what if we're looking at two groups that are repeated measures, so that's measurements taken on the same group on two different occasions, where well, we would use the repeated measures t-test or the Wilcox and sign rank test, which is the non-parametric equivalent. So we can see already that most of these tests will have a parametric and then a non-parametric equivalent. So again, we need to see whether we meet the assumptions of the parametric test. And for the paired samples t-test, the assumptions are, again, interval or ratio data, which we've already established from our flowchart. But this time we want to know whether the differences between the pre and the post scores are normally distributed. So you would just subtract score one from score two, and that would then, mm -hmm. and then do a histogram on that, and that would tell you whether there's normal distribution. So the next thing we want to consider is how many independent variables we have and this is where we're looking at more than, again looking at more than two groups so if we've got three different groups we, yeah. we looked at the math set one yeah. we want to know how many independent variables we've got we're not really going to touch on if you've got two or more but just to be aware that if you do have two or more independent variables if you wanted to look at say sex and age as a two cutoffs mm -hmm. and, and scores on MRCS then you could use something called factorial ANOVA, but we won't, mm -hmm. we won't discuss that now. We'll just look at if we've got one independent variable, in which case we would either use the one-way ANOVA, which is the parametric test, or crush core wallace which is the non-parametric equivalent. Mm -hmm. What's ANOVA? Um, analysis of variance. Yeah. So it, it just explains how the test works. It, it essentially looks for um, variances which we've discussed what they are within and between groups and works out a ratio and that's how the, the mm -hmm. test works. So the assumptions of the one-way ANOVA is either interval or ratio data which we've already identified, again are the groups normally distributed and again homogeneity of variance for which you can do a Levens test again and again if you violated those assumptions you can use the non-parametric Crush-Core Wallace test. Mm. So now we're going to look at whether our groups are whether our groups are repeated measures on the same participants. So this would refer specifically to maybe two situations. So if we're looking at more than two groups and we're looking at repeated measures, for example, if we're testing at least three measurements on one group, so you might want to test scores at time zero, time one, time two, whatever they are. Yeah. You would use either the parametric test, which is the repeated measures ANOVA, or the non-parametric test, which would be the Friedman test. And again, you want to test the assumptions of the repeated measures ANOVA, which in common with previous things is interval or ratio data. Data needs to be normally distributed. And then you also need this third thing, which is called sphericity, which is similar to homogeneity of variance. And this is tested using something called Mulchi's test, which it's kind of similar to the Levens test we've tested earlier, and that will tell you whether that um, assumption's violated. And often in SPSS, that's given as the output for the repeated measures ANOVA. So that would be something like, uh, you quite commonly see in surgical things, say pain score on day one, pain score on day five, pain score on day seven. So you've got the same group of people having the same thing measured 
over a period of time. Yes. And, and perhaps normally it should be like, you know, day 11, day 15 and ad infinitum, couldn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So in summary, what I wanted to do here was try and highlight that selecting the correct statistical test is a very logical process and all you need to do is ask yourselves the quite simple and straightforward questions that we've asked during the flowchart and that's best achieved by just understanding the basic terms of what a particular variable is and what type of data you have. If you can learn that then you'll know how to use the flowchart and hopefully I've illustrated that it's a very stepwise logical process similar to how we would use clinical guideline flowcharts. Mm -hmm. And if anybody wants to know how to perform these particular statistical tests, if they've used the flowchart, I'd recommend Andy Field's book called Discovering Statistics Using SPSS. It's a very good introductory text, and it's, it tells you exactly how to do these tests in SPSS, which is the normal software people would start on, so I would recommend that as some good introductory reading. Oh, so that's, uh, that's really clear. Um, thanks very much. Brett, um, and I suppose the other way around is if you're reading a paper and you see they've used a particular test or one of those that we've covered here, you can work backwards up that decision tree and, and you can tell whether they've used the correct test or not. And you know, one of the big things is people have what's probably non parametric data and apply parametric tests to it, isn't it? And, uh, and or the wrong kind of test for the, for the wrong kind of variable. So uh, that's really handy. I think uh, that's be very useful and uh, very useful one. Uh, it's looking at the statistical plan of all the papers you have to read. Anyway, well, thank you very much indeed. That's really, really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another podcast brought to you by School of Surgery. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook at School of Surgery, on iTunes, on Podomatic at schoolofsurgery.podomatic.com, and finally, by searching School of Surgery on YouTube. Thank you very much, and see you next time.